Hey everybody, this is Kenny. Welcome back to another edition of the Yak with Max. Today, I've got the second part of my three-part series of my lesson for my 25, almost 25 years here in leadership. Listen in. Hey there, everybody. This is Kenny. Welcome back. Welcome back to another edition of the Yak with Mac. And this is the second of a three-part series on my lessons from my nearly quarter century, quarter century at Sprint and T-Mobile. And it is winding down. September 2nd will be my last day with the company. And I'm just so thankful and so blessed to be able to just kind of sum up. It would take way more than three episodes, right, for me to sum up my career. But I wanted to really just break it down to at least three things per segment of lessons that I learned along the way. And just a shout out to everybody that's played uh, either a big part or even a small part in this journey that I've had. Today, I want to just shout out Sharon O'Brien, who took a chance on me and I'm not even going to make that my lesson today. I think I'm going to make that my last lesson, but you got to take a chance on people. At some point, just go ahead and jump and take a chance on people. And she did that with me actually more than once. <laughs> but but the big one was the first time. And Sharon, I'll say this because I, I know you're going to watch and listen. Uh, yeah, I'm, I was by far your best hire. You know, come on. Um, but she took a big chance on me, this store manager, relatively successful store manager, I might add, um, and helping make him a trainer and making that decision to bring him into a total different different realm of the company. Okay, so I wanna talk about some lessons that I learned that were from my support position because I've spent about half of my career in the field and about half my career you know, in support roles. And, and I even consider this last role that I've had where I'm actually, where I was actually leading a team of eight, I still consider that a support role because it was twofold for me. I was supporting them, uh, but I was also supporting folks in the field. And I've had a couple of roles like that. And I've also had a couple of roles where I was an individual contributor, such as when I was a trainer, such as when I was a regional sales manager, where it was strictly all about supporting the field. So from those early days as a trainer, I learned this very, very early because being a trainer, that could be some serious business. You have to take that seriously. You are seeing at that time, every three weeks or so, we are seeing brand new employees. And those were employees that outside of meeting their store leadership team, we were the first faces that they saw corporate wise that kind of represented the company. So I took that role very seriously. When I did leadership training, I took that equally as seriously, even though typically for then it was leaders that had been around for a while, but sometimes we got leaders that were very, very new to the company in leadership class. But focusing on new hire, I, I if I didn't make it a little bit lighthearted and, and let people know that it was okay to laugh here, that you were going to have some fun. You were going to learn a lot. We had long days, right? We started at nine. We ended at either five, five thirty, or six o'clock even sometimes. But I just wanted people to know that you can come and you can laugh and I'm not going to take myself seriously. So I don't want you to take yourself too seriously either. So my first lesson today is laugh. Don't take yourself that seriously. You have to be able to laugh. Now, I will also say it's a hundred percent fine to laugh at yourself. It is 100% not fine to laugh or make fun of others. I never did that. And I, I even when that was probably, uh, now it's, you know, way against HR to do that. I never did it, you know, back then. It, it just it never felt right to make fun of people. That felt like high school for me, you know. But I wanted people to laugh along with me as I told stories. And I really, I think I spent more time making fun of myself than anything else. And, and I'll, I want to give you uh, just a really quick example. And, and by the way, my almost 25 years went like that very, very quickly. So you have to really enjoy the time. That's not a really official lesson, but enjoy the time because it goes quick, man. Before you know it, you know, you're here 10, 12, 14 years. And, you know, next thing you know, you're almost here 25 years like myself. It goes quick, so you have to enjoy and you have to be able to 
to walk away and make a difference in other people's lives, but walk away with the type of memories that I have. Anyway, I'll give you a real quick example. One of the best jokes that I used to have, and I got other trainers involved in this, is that whenever I would make my class laugh, I would tell them, usually towards the end of the day, and maybe this is not a good thing. Maybe I shouldn't be revealing this. I'm just kidding. It's okay. Um, that I, I would tell them that, hey, by the way, guys, if you thought I was funny tonight, I have two shows right here at Chuckles in Times Square. Hint, hint, there's no such place as Chuckles in Times Square, New York. But anyway, um, and, and listen, I have one show at 9, one show at 11. It's a two-drink minimum. You have to tip your waiter, though. Uh, admission is free. And come and see me as I do my stand-up routine. Most people didn't believe that. It was like chuckles. And they, you know, just in the very early days, they didn't have any mechanism to look that up except on a computer. But as we got along, people would look that up and they'd say, yo, Kenny, I, I can't find chuckles here in, in my phone. I was like, hey, I'm just kidding. There's no such thing. I don't do that. I'm just, uh, it's just a joke. And nobody for years ever actually came back into the city until years later Myself and my partner, Rich, God rest his soul, we, we said that same thing. He and I were telling a few jokes together in a class. And one guy came in the next morning and he said, I don't want to say this too loud, but I couldn't find chuckles. I came back last night and he was dead serious. I thought he was joking with us. He was dead serious. I couldn't find it last night. I mean, you sure it's Times Square? Was it on you know, 48th Street or somewhere like that? And, and we looked at each other and we were like, oh, no. And now a lot of the class heard and they're staring and they're staring to see what are we going to say next? Because they know we were joking. We said, Did we say Chuckles in New York City? No, last night we were at Chuckles in Long Island. Very quick, right? Um, I think those were some memorable moments for the people in that class. And we pulled the guy aside later and we apologized to him. And we said, hey, we'll reimburse, reimburse your subway fare, whatever it was. Of course, no, he said, I was, I was in the city anyway. I just figured I'd check you guys out. You guys are so funny. I wanted to see a whole couple of hours of you guys just having jokes. Listen, I'm not a stand-up comedian. I couldn't do that if I tried. Uh, or more power to stand-up comedians, right? But here's my lesson number one today. Laugh, laugh at yourself, laugh often, have fun. Last thing I'll say about this topic is that I've gotten the honor and pleasure of speaking to new employees, but also speaking to grizzled veteran vice presidents, right? Here's a lesson that I know that I know that I know. And that is everyone likes a good laugh. Everyone. So it's okay. As long as it's in good taste, as long as you're not making fun of anybody, everyone likes a good laugh. All right, here's my big key. If you are thinking about going into a support role. And I think that if you are in a support role, you are still in leadership because you're now supporting leadership and you're supporting the rest of the field. The most important thing I feel that you can do in that, and I have a couple other things, but I think this is A number one, is build relationships. And it, it, it's it got to be a little bit of a one-way street for you at first to build those relationships. You've got to be the one that picks up the phone. You've got to be the one that sends emails out. You've got to be the one that shows up in person and lets people know I am totally here for you. In my regional sales manager days, that was the first time I started really supporting a lot of different parts of the country. And I remember supporting Philadelphia, which I, I went to a lot. And the first time, a couple of times I went there, they were like, who's this like New York guy, man? Thinking he could come down here and tell us what to do here in Philly. So I was like, uh oh, let me take a different approach and let these guys know that Philadelphia's success to me is going to be more important than New York City's success, right? I want to see this market really succeed. I remember the market was really struggling at the time. And, and so just going one at a time, store after store, week after week, taking a drive on a Sunday night so I could get started on early on a Monday morning, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of phone calls, a lot of just, hey, man, so how was your weekend? Hey, hey tell me a little bit about your family. You know, in between the, hey, how can I help you make your store better type conversation or, hey, let me coach that rep that just missed about five steps in our selling process. I'll go and I'll stay with them for the next couple of hours. Uh, in between that, you just got to know people on a personal level. And, and here's the other thing. You have to learn how to fit in in different cultures. 
You see here in New York, we could talk really, really fast. I supported the South as far down as Virginia Beach. And I can remember we had one of the busiest stores in Virginia, uh, Virginia Beach. Shout out to Otis Humphreys, who's still with the company. And I can remember, I, I felt like, man, I, don't, I also don't want them to think I'm some fast-talking New Yorker. So I really practiced hard, and I learned how to just talk a little bit slower, not really, you know, have, I tried to lose a little bit of the New York accent. That's kind of impossible. But I've made it a point to do some research on what the culture was like down there. What were their pain points? As an example, that particular store, if I remember right, in Virginia Beach was next to a Chick-fil-A. I'd never heard of Chick-fil-A at the time, but it was next to a very, very busy Chick-fil-A. And they had very little parking spaces. So that was a big deal. So I took that back and eventually, you know, that the parking expanded in that lot. I didn't make that decision. I just ran that up the ladder for them. So really dig into the culture whenever you're supporting. And if you're supporting in your home market, still, if you're like me in New York City, Brooklyn is different from the Bronx. And I'm a guy that's from the Bronx. I wasn't very familiar with Brooklyn. So I, I had to familiarize myself not only to get around, um, you know, properly in Brooklyn, but what were some of their pain points? It was different than in the Bronx. You got to really immerse yourself. Here was probably, remember last week I said I didn't remember when I made it all about myself. This was the time. This was when my career shifted and every single waking moment was about somebody else. So for me in that role, every single waking moment was about me helping Boston, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and New York City. It was all about making those, doing whatever I could do to help make those markets successful. It was a support role. I didn't have any authority or anything like that, but I had influence and I earned influence after a while. So when you're in a support role, just to recap, you got to build those relationships. You have to make sure that you know what puzzles they're trying to put together and you help them put that together. You want to definitely learn about the culture, wherever that's at. And again, it's a one-way street. You're not going to expect people in Virginia Beach to talk to you like you're a New Yorker. It's up to you now to fit into that culture down there in Virginia Beach so that you can relate well to those folks that are down there. And I found that stores were stores were stores. That store in Virginia Beach had some of the same problems, issues, and some of the same successes of busy stores right in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. But, you know, you have to really do your homework and do your research to figure that stuff out. Make everything, every waking moment about someone else's success. Because guess what? It'll come back to you. I mentioned this last week that my blessings, my many, many blessings came 20-fold because I helped others. And I never was looking for it. I had stopped looking for the accolades or anything like that. It's always nice to get them, but I stopped looking for them. All right. Here's my third my third little piece of advice, if you are going into a support role, volunteer for stuff, excuse me, that no one else wants to do. Volunteer to do jobs that no one else wants to do. There's one or two that even all these years later, I can't talk about. Very, very confidential, but I'll tell you this. I volunteered for a couple of things that no one else wanted any part of. Here's one that I could tell you about. I volunteered to write playbook articles. I raised my hand. I didn't know what kind of articles these were going to be. Someone said, hey, who wants to, you know, write articles for the playbook? I don't think we have the playbook anymore. We still have versions of the playbook out there. It's an old sprint thing. I know T-Mobile had playbooks as well. But that was a weekly thing that came out. And it was a big deal, man, if you were asked to contribute to that. And so I was asked to write anonymously. I wasn't getting any credit or anything like that for it. And here was the topic I had. I had to talk about stores that had issues that got escalated to customer care that could have been resolved in the store. And I had to go out and find real issues. So think about this. I used those relationships that I had and I would make phone calls. It'll say, hey, didn't you have an escalated customer issue last week? Could you tell me a little bit about that? And before you tell me about it, I have to say, I have to write an article about this that's not going to paint you in a really good light because you turned an issue over to care that you probably should have handled yourself. But I am going to put what were some lessons that you took away from this issue. 
I'm not going to mention your store though, right? So we didn't mention store names or, hey, this manager did this. Man, that was a tough gig. And, and it, it's probably, it was probably tougher than I just made it sound because there were also times where I, I didn't get hung up on, but I was like, Kenny, come on. I, I, that's in the rear view mirror. I had to deal with that issue for months, even after I solved it with the customer, after I turned it over to care. Okay. The whole point was we were trying to educate managers at that time that pretty much they could do most things that care could do, but there were a lot of managers that just chose not to back then. Most managers took care of it, but there were a few that chose not to. And, and so that was uncomfortable. That's probably the best example that I can share, you know, right now, but that was just one of those examples of volunteering for stuff that nobody else is going to do. And again, are you going to get accolades for that? I never, it was never something in the playbook that said, Hey, this article was by Kenny McCuller. Nothing. I never said that, but when someone brought it up, Hey, I, I read this in the playbook the other day, this was pretty good. I wonder where this at, you know, and I happened to be in a store and say, um, I wrote that. I can't tell you where the store was, but, but I wrote that. What did you think? What'd you take from that? So, okay. Has that happened here in your store? You know, you would just then be able to have a conversation starter, you know, around that. All right. Let me recap today. So three lessons from my support years, which were a lot of years, laugh a lot. Don't take yourself too seriously. Laugh at you. Don't make fun of others, but laugh a lot. Have fun. It's still okay to have fun at work. I know it's serious business these days, right? It was always serious business for me, but I wanted to make it a little bit lighthearted and let people relax and be able to be themselves around me. When you support people, build those relationships, help them solve the puzzles that they have. Make sure you do a lot of research on how you fit into that particular culture and that particular community. And remember, that could be a one-way street and make everything about the people you're trying to support. And I mean everything, every waking moment about them and not about you. It will come back to you tenfold. And finally, volunteer for stuff that no one else wants to do. All right. I've got music playing in the background on the podcast here. I can't wait to come back next week and give you a recap of my years as a district manager, as well as my years of having direct reports and training, uh, which kind of split there, you know, uh, but this is a joy and a pleasure for me to be able to do this. So for now, this is Kenny. This has been the Yak with Mac. I will talk to you next week.